A while ago, I committed to an experiment. I committed to the experiment that I wanted to use my phone for one week with voiceover enabled. No turning it off, no cheating. I was just able to use the apps that were actually supported by voiceover. Of course, I was still able to see the screen, but I learned a lot of lessons during this week. Like, for example, Tinder really does not work with voiceover enabled, but so do many other apps. And often it was the small things that were actually the biggest problem. Like this one time where I just forgot my headphones and wanted to use my phone in the subway, but I couldn't because I didn't want that everyone else would hear what's on my screen. But why, why did I do this? Why did I commit to this experiment? For this, we have to go a little bit back. It all started with a coffee in the morning. It was a regular working day. I came into the office in the morning sat down in front of my computer. Does anyone else in here do customer support from time to time? Um, I work for a pretty small company, so from time to time we have to do support, like I had to do on this day. So I scrolled through the support emails until I found a quite interesting one by Jessica. Hi, I'm a visually impaired user of Apple products, and I'm wondering if your app works with voiceover. My first reaction was, why? Why would she want to use our app with voiceover? So for context, I work for MindNote. Um, we work on a mind mapping visual brainstorming app. So it's very focused on the visual part. So I was puzzled. Why, wanted, why would a visually impaired user want to use our app with voiceover? If you don't know what mind mapping is, it's not important. This is a typical mind map that you can see here. But in short, it's a visual and graphic thinking tool to organize your ideas. So you would, wouldn't think that a visually impaired or blind person would be interested in using something like mind mapping. But it got me kind of interested, so I asked Jessica why she would want to do that. I'd like to write an autobiography and need a place to write down my ideas and construct chapters. So that kind of sounded like a perfectly normal use case to me. Write down your ideas and organize your thoughts. I was still skeptical, though, that like, adding voiceover support to our app would be of any benefit at all. Well, turns out I was wrong. And this is what brings me here today to talk about the power of making your app accessible. My name is Matthias Tretter, and as I already mentioned, I work for MindNote. And my talk has this rather illusional subtitle of making the world become a better place, making the world a better place. But I believe that's really what it's all about. So some in here might have already used accessibility APIs on certain platforms. For others, it's probably new. Can I have a quick show of hands who here has already worked with accessibility? One, two, three, four. OK, a couple of hands. So let's start with the most important question. Why should we actually care? I could come up with several reasons, like it's pretty easy to add accessibility support to your app, it increases your user base, it helps with testing, with UI testing especially. But to be honest, there's actually just one real reason, because it is the right thing to do. I don't know about you, but I personally, sometimes I get frustrated when I'm at work. On some days I really love my work, and on other days, I struggle. And what I found out is I struggle when I forgot the why, when I forgot why I'm actually doing this, because I have the deep need that my work brings value to the world. But then sometimes I remember that we as developers have such a unique power and chance, because our work scales so easily, we can easily reach thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people out there and help improve their lives with the work that we do. So I think it's not only our responsibility, it's our obligation to do this. And our goal should always be 
to provide an equal experience for all of our users. For many of us, being able to use a smartphone, being able to use a certain app is pretty great, but most of all, it's convenient, right? But for people with disabilities, it can be downright life-changing because it enables them to do things that they were never able to do before. It gives them empowerment and independence. There are many myths about accessibility out there, so I'd like to take a look at some of them and contrast them with reality. Like one very common myth is that visually impaired users are blind. That's actually a very common belief. And somehow we implicitly seem, uh, seem to assume the most extreme case. But in reality, of course, there's an entire spectrum, starting with corrective lenses up to complete blindness. And every, like everyone has different needs. So the needs of partially sighted users are quite different from the needs of um, completely blind users. I really like this graph by Microsoft. It's called the Persona Spectrum. And it reminds us that we are actually dealing with a whole range of different impairments. And also, they are not only permanent, but also they are temporal and situational impairments. So maybe you only have one arm that's a permanent um, disablement, but probably you also just had an accident and you have a broken arm, so it's temporal. Or you're a new parent, you're just holding a little child and you're left with one hand that you can use to deal with your apps. So every one of us is actually affected from time to time by this, whether it's situational, temporary or permanent. Another pretty common belief is that visually impaired users access everything sequentially, one thing after the other. So when I first sat down with Jessica and I first watched someone actually using an iOS device with voiceover enabled, that kind of blew me away because I expected the whole process to be very slow. But she had an incredible memory of location and it makes sense, right? Once you know where a button to compose a new message is, you don't have to look for the, on the whole screen to find that button again. You go straight to that button. And it's the same with visually impaired users. They use their memory of location to speed up things. And another very common belief is that visually impaired users listen to all on-screen text. That's another lesson that you learn pretty quickly if you watch someone actually use a device. They listen to just enough to orient themselves because it's all about being efficient. So this is why it's so important that the accessibility labels, which we're going to talk about later, are short, concise, and precise. Because the shorter they are, the quicker um, visually impaired users know what's on screen. And it's actually possible to change the speed of the, of the, the speech rate of the text that's read out to you. So many uh, users that actually use voiceover use it at the highest speed. And this is how it sounds like. Hi folks, you're having a good time? I'm so sorry you have to find out that way. But we are on coffee. Please don't blame the messenger. So was anyone able to understand anything? <laughs> you can try it again. Hi folks, you're having a good time? I'm so sorry you have to find out that way. But we are on coffee. Please don't blame the messenger. So that's the highest speed. So it's all about efficiency. I personally prefer this speed. Hi folks, you're having a good time? I'm so sorry you have to find out that way. But we are out of coffee. Please don't blame the messenger. So that's quite a difference, right? And when I sat down with Jessica, she, ha she had to turn down the speed a little bit so that I could understand anything. So you have heard me use the term voiceover a couple of times already, but what actually is voiceover? Voiceover is Apple's screen reader technology. And what it does, it turns the whole screen into an input area. And it reads out the stuff that's under your finger. So you can pan around, and it reads out what's under your finger to you. There's a wide range of accessibility technologies out there, just as there's a wide range of disabilities, starting with the most simple things like localization. Like, for example, being here in Russia, every time I see something written in English, I'm happy because otherwise I'm completely lost. Like, actually, earlier today, I had to ask someone which button I have to press on the coffee machine because everything was written in Russian and I, couldn't, I didn't know or right-to-left language support for languages like Arabic, dynamic type to adjust the font size to your user's preferences, bold text to make the text stand out even more and make it easier readable, 
reduced motion to help people with motion sickness, reduced transparency, and so forth. There's a wide range of technologies. But the most popular one, and the one we're going to focus on today, is voiceover. So usually during talks, um, you're probably asked to put away your devices and like focus on the speaker or focus on the presentation. This talk is different. I would actually like you all to take out your iPhones if you have them with you. So everyone who has their iPhones with you, please take them out. And I'm going to show you the easiest way to enable voiceover on your device. And this is if you go into the Settings app and then to General Accessibility and you scroll down all the way, you're going to find an entry called Accessibility Shortcut there. And if you tap on it, you can enable voiceover. And what this does now, voiceover is always just a triple click away. On the iPhone 10, it's a triple click on the side button. On the other iPhones, it's a triple click on the home button. So you can try it out if you've enabled it. Triple click should activate voiceover, and another triple click should deactivate it again. And this is very handy because it allows you to test like a certain screen of your app with voiceover enabled. You just go to that screen like you usually do, then you triple click on the home button or side button, test that screen with voiceover enabled, and then you triple click to disable it again. Very handy for testing. So let's go through the most important gestures on how to actually use a device with voiceover enabled. The most basic gesture, the simplest gesture, is a normal tap. And what it does is it, change the, it changes the voiceover focus, also called the cursor, to that element, and it reads out the accessibility label. It's kind of like a keyboard focus on the Mac where you, that you can change with the arrow keys, but you can change it with your finger. And you can either tap on elements on screen or you can just pan around the screen and it will focus on the elements under your finger and read out the accessibility label. And if you can see, then you will see a small black border around the currently focused element. So that indicates the voiceover cursor. But since a single tap on an element just focuses on, on it and it doesn't interact with it yet, we need another gesture to actually tap that button, to actually interact with that button, which is a double tap. So this is, kinda, this is more or less the, uh, the same as if you would normally tap a button. Now you can double tap and uh, you would interact with that button. When I first tried, it, tried this, I tried to double tap within that small black rectangle but that would actually be impossible for someone who is blind. So you can double tap anywhere on screen and it will activate the currently focused element. Another handy, gest uh, handy gesture is a simple swipe to the left or right where you can just change the focus sequentially. So you step from one element to the next or to the previous one. And that's super handy to explore what's on screen because you can step by step go through all the elements on screen and get to know the screen. So this also indicates that the order is important when you're dealing with accessibility because you don't want the cursor to like jump around randomly on screen. So um, we need to take care of this when we're implementing voiceover support so that the order actually makes sense for the user. Then there is a pretty neat gesture called the magic tap, which is a two finger double tap anywhere on screen. Many apps have like one most important action. Like in the phone app, for example, it would be taking an incoming call. In the music app, it would st uh, start or stop playing the music playback. In the camera app, it would be taking a picture. And maybe your app ha also has something like one most important action. Uh, if that's the case, you can implement a magic tap and then the user can trigger it at any place in your app with a two finger double tap. And the last ones of the basic and most important accessibility gestures is the escape gesture. It's, you kind of draw a set with two fingers on the screen anywhere. And if there's a, a model dialog, it dismisses it. Or if you're using a navigation controller, you are navigation controller, it just pops one screen back. So it's kind of similar to the escape key on your MacBook if you still have a MacBook with an escape key. So now that we know the most important gestures. Let's take a look at, yeah, at them in action. Let's take a look at the video. My note. Pizza list. Alert. Rename document. 
button. Dismiss pop up. Pizza lit button. Button. Search field is editing. Character mode. Kako heads meeting. Today. Select MN documents icon. But Kako heads meeting. But Kako heads meeting. Kako heads meeting. Board. Kako heads meeting. Text field. MN documents icon. MN mind maps. MN document source icon. Button. Need support? Need support? So that wasn't very glorious, right? So that was the state of accessibility in MindNote before we actually started to work on it. And keep in mind that what you saw on the video was MindNote being used by a sighted person that knows MindNote in and out because he's one of the developers of MindNote. So it would have been impossible for any blind user to actually do anything with MindNote at all. So how can we improve this? With UI accessibility. That's Apple's framework that we can use to provide accessibility information about the UI elements on screen. And this information is then used by voiceover and other assistive technologies to help users with disabilities. And at the heart of UI accessibility is an informal protocol, so just an extension on NS object. So there are several properties in this informal protocol that we can use to improve our voiceover support. The most boring one, and at the same time, most important one is accessibility label. Um, it's what describes the UI to blind users, and it's what VoiceOver reads out first. So if you remember myth number three, that VoiceOver users don't listen to all on-screen text, then it becomes clear why this is so important. And it has to be very short, descriptive, and it shouldn't include the type of the control because the type is actually specified in the accessibility trait. So don't call it create button because then voiceover reads, uh, voiceover reads out create button button. And that becomes kind of annoying after a while. So just call it create. If it's not clear what's gonna be created, you can probably say create document, but that's as long as it should get. Most of your accessibility labels actually should be just a single word. And there's no full stop at the end to help voiceover pronounce it correctly. And what's very important is localization again, even more with, with voiceover than with anything else in your app. Because otherwise people don't understand it and then it doesn't help. So speaking of localization, you can use accessibility language to specify in which language the text actually gets read out. If you don't specify this, it will just get read out in the system language, which is probably correct most of the time. But sometimes you have specific terms that you want to be pronounced in a specific language, like, for example, personal names or app names. And if not, if you don't specify this, this is how iCloud Drive sounds on a German device. iCloud Derive. So this is literally how the app name was spoken back in iOS 10 when the app was still called iCloud Drive, now it's called Files. So if you don't specify the language, it will just try to, um, yeah, just try to say it in the language of the system, which would, would have been wrong in this in this case. So you can use accessibility language to fix this, but sometimes that's not possible because of your localization workflow, or maybe the string is part of a bigger string and you can't actually specify, you only want to translate this one. So what else can we do? We can get creative and do something like this. This is how we specified iCloud Drive back then in our localization for accessibility, and this is how it sounds like. iCloud Drive. It's not perfect, but kind of sounds like my accent, I guess, but uh, it's better than iCloud Derive. Um, there are many, many other properties in, in your accessibility in the informal protocol, like the accessibility hint, accessibility traits. So I encourage you to check them all out if you're working on accessibility support. But for now, let's see what we can do to step up the game a little bit, to take it one step further. One very, very interesting class is your accessibility custom action. And it's so great because it kind of makes the difference be 
between an accessible app and a really great to use app with voiceover. You can think of it like a context menu or right click menu on a Mac and you can specify actions that you can perform on the currently focused element. Like if you're currently focused on a document, you can specify actions to move that document somewhere else, to rename it, to delete it, duplicate it, and so forth. Another pretty handy class is your accessibility custom rotor. So usually when we as sighted people browse the web, we don't read the whole website from top to bottom, right? We, s we start with skimming it. We look at images, headlines, links, everything that pops out to get an idea of what's on the website. And then we decide whether we actually want to read the whole website or not. And the rotor is what enables the same kind of workflow for blind people. Because you can twist or they can twist the fingers on screen every time and then, uh, then maybe switch to headlines, and then they can skip through all the headlines on the website, or to links, and skip through all the links on the website. So it's pretty great, again, to make it more efficient. And if there's something like this in your own app, for example, you have a document-based app with documents and folders, you could, for example, specify a router to simply go through all the folders on screen and skip the documents in between. So if everything works, then now it's time for a demo. We'll see. Ah, there you go. So this is MindNote, and I'm not going to enable VoiceOver with the triple click I showed you earlier. VoiceOver on. MindNote. Landscape. Home button to the right. So it's currently focused on, on the heading label, and we can, with a simple swipe to the right, we can step through the elements on screen. Swift and OBJ, 08.04.2018, 14, 28, 248 kilobytes, file, that actions available. <laughs> that was a tap, not a swipe. I actually wanted to Edit. go here. Button, locations, expanded, button, heading, expanded. Double tap to collapse. So the UI that you see here is your document browser view controller. And I could actually give a whole talk about why I love your document browser view controller and why I hate your document browser view controller at the same time. One example, for example, is that it doesn't respect the accessibility labels of our custom controls. Button. So it just reads out button. Well, this should actually be called settings. I, fail, I filed like 20 or 30 radars about this class, which just resembles the files app UI in your own app. But it's great still. So. Journaling with MindNode. Today, 14.55. Upload error. File. Actions available. So let's go into a document and see actually our own UI. Selected. Prompts. Main node. So what we do is swipe up or down to select a custom action, <laughs> then double tap to activate. So what, what you just he heard here, swipe up or down to select a custom action and then double tap, tap to activate, is actually the hint that there are your accessibility custom actions available. And then you can swipe up or down and uh, select that action. Or you can swipe review of the week. To level the one. To the one. right and go through hard. all the elements. Level two. Note what, what was good. Level what will I try differently next time? What are the trends? Level two, node four, open task. And we try to like, give the most important information first, which is the title, then give some context information about where this node is actually located, at which level, which uh, node index, and then some additional information. This one, for example, has an open task attached. And if I now swipe up or down, I can step through all the custom actions. Edit title, delete node, create new child, create new sibling. Remove task. Complete task. And I can, for example, with a double tap, trigger that action. Connect. Tap node to connect. Or trigger another one. And what was good? Level two. Created connection. Cross connection. Connecting node what are the trends? And note what was good? Apostrophe. All right. So that's basically what you can do. Now we have 
several actions on nodes, on connections, and you can do everything with voiceover that you can do without. And now I can try this uh, set gesture, so I'm just drawing a set on screen. Mind no. And Heading. it will close the screen, which is the escape gesture. Voiceover off. So that was a short demo of the voiceover support in MindNote. Oh, yeah. So next up is actually my favorite part of the talk, because uh, it's your time to work, and I can just watch. Um, so I would like you all to take out your iPhones again, um, and stay on the lock screen. And then enable voiceover with the triple click that you activated before. And now I'd like you to use three fingers and triple tap on screen with three fingers. So one, two, three. Hmm? Um, the side button. So on iPhone 10, it's a triple, ta uh, triple click on the side button. On the other iPhones, it's a triple click on the home button. So and if you then do a triple tap with three fingers on screen, if you succeed it, your screen should look like this. Oh, I've heard it. Yeah. So a three finger triple tap activates screen curtain, and it turns the whole screen black, which is a feature. Because if you can't see anything, why waste the battery of the whole screen? And also, it's a security feature. Because you can see it, so all the other people around you also can see it. And now I have a challenge for you. I would like you, with voiceover enabled, to take a selfie. So hopefully, you all remember the gestures that we walked through earlier, with like panning around the screen to go through the elements, double tap to activate an element, two-finger double tap to trigger the most important action in an app. Yeah, so we're going to have some time and try to take a selfie. <laughs> you, you can swipe left or right to go through all the elements. Oh, you, you want to scroll to another page? You can use three fingers uh, and, and swipe to left or right. Anyone already succeeded? Oh, yeah? Nice. Couple of hands. So if you're up to, you can also try to post it on Twitter with voiceover enabled. Uh, if not, I would also love if you just post it normally on Twitter. Actually, Twitter apps have pretty good accessibility support, at least the official one and Twitterific. Don't know about Tweetbot. Um, but that's a voluntary extra task. Um, if you're still stuck with screen curtain enabled and your screen is black, you can use three finger triple tap again to deactivate it. Hi, I'm a visually impaired user of Apple products and I'm wondering if your app works with voiceover. So back when I stumbled upon that email of Jessica, I was puzzled. I didn't understand why she would want to use our app, a visual app, with voiceover enabled. And it's mostly because I was lacking one thing, empathy. So this is why I decided to take on the challenge back then. This is why I decided to spend one week with voiceover enabled on my phone, to get better at empathy. 
And nowadays, Jessica is actually part of our beta team and helps give of giving us feedback on our voiceover implementation. My note is still not perfect, but if a user asks us nowadays whether our app supports voiceover, we can happily answer yes. And to me, this is the power of making your app accessible. And this is how we can all help make the world a better place. Thank you. So if there are any questions, now it's your time. Question over there. Thank you very much. Uh, how long does it take to make your program accessible uh, from scratch? Um, that's uh, actually hard to answer question, but if you're using mostly uh, standard controls, chances are that your app is already accessible and that you don't even have to do anything, if you're lucky. Um, but if not, um, it may probably just takes from a couple of hours to, for us, it was more work because we have kind of special app with the visual focus. We had to go an extra mile and do more stuff. And obviously, there's always more things that you can improve. But uh, investing a couple of hours is already enough to make an app actually accessible and usable. And that's the most important part and first step. And uh, one more question. Uh, you told about uh, UI testing. Uh -huh. um, um, well, was um, uh, this work uh, made your UI tests better, or, and uh, what about UI testing? <laughs> um, so UI testing and uh, UI accessibility are kind of connected on iOS, because you can, for example, use the accessibility identifier to like access certain elements on screen and tell them to, to tap it and, and stuff like this in UI tests. And I've, I've talked with a friend about this um, a couple of months ago. And he, he mentioned something that kind of resonated with me. He, he said, if you are like having troubles to make your app accessible, then it kind of hints that you are having troubles. No, no, it was the other way around. If you're having troubles making your app testable with UI tests, then it hints that you're having troubles making your app accessible as well, because they're so linked together. And if you have a nice structure for one, it helps a lot with a nice structure for the other thing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, question over here. Hi, uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, and I have a couple of questions. Um, <laughs> imagine that you have a table view with uh, some cells, mm -hmm. and uh, on uh, uh, top on any cell, a uh, detailed view opens. And is there a right way to return focus back to the selected cell after we return from detailed view? Like, you mean when you like? You, you select the table view, then you push a new screen, and then when you go back. Yes, and yeah. uh, I should return focus to the selected cell. OK. okay. And uh, is there a right, right way to do it? Um, OK. Yeah, there's for, um, there is a function in Objective-C called UI Accessibility Post Notification. Um, and I think it's uh, layout changed or screen changed um, that you need to, to specify as parameter. Like the, it, the function has two parameters. The first one is the type of the notification, mm -hmm. and the second one is of type ID, so you can specify anything. And if you specify a UI element there that's accessible, then this X, uh, element will get selected. That's actually what we use. Um, like if you remember the demo, when, uh, when I opened the document, um, the main node, the, the node in the middle, was immediately selected. So that's what we use there to select that node, because usually, like the top left control would be selected first. Okay, thanks. Then I do try it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then uh, second question: Do you use keyboard key or place sound to accessibility trace? Uh, I could not uh, imagine any usage of these traits. Uh, I'm so <laughs> sorry, can you repeat that question? I think I didn't um, get it. Do you use um, place sound trait or keyboard key traits? Keyboard key traits, no, I never had to use use them. It's like if you're making something that's kind of like a keyboard. But uh, any, any usage, uh, any example of usage, b because I cannot imagine any. Uh, like th there are certain apps that have like a, a locked area where you then you have to enter a passcode, for example. Mm -hmm. And many of them 
use a custom like keyboard with just numbers, for example. Mm -hmm. So this would be one example where you could use this. Okay, and for place sound, <laughs> uh, there is a <laughs> start media session. Uh -huh. uh, it's okay. It's I understand. And place sound, I. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I guess okay. if there's like uh, some sound effects in your app, but I never had to use that <laughs> one because we don't use any sounds. So. Okay, and no. the third question: uh, Is there any usage of accessibility identifier except uh, UI testing? Um, that's the main usage for me. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, it's it's just an identifier, and there are probably other things that you can do in your app to access an element with that certain identifier, but UI testing is like the main usage. Okay, yeah. thank you. Welcome. There's a question over there. Hi. Uh, first okay. of all, I would like to say thanks for your great presentation. And uh, my question is, uh, uh, as we just already saw that for us it's very difficult to use uh, iPhone and the voiceover functions uh, for us, for people without any uh, uh, weakness. And uh, my question is, uh, how will we uh, we able to know that our app uh, with uh, different functions of uh, accessibility will be good for uh, special uh, users, for special our users? And the second one question is uh, uh, how we can set for our business management that we need to adopt our uh, app application for these users? Thanks. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd like to, s to start with the first question. Like, the question was, how do you basically know whether it's y whether you're implementing it correct or whether it's the right way you're doing it? Um, it's it's a, t a tough one. Um, the best way to to verify is to have an actual user that either gives you feedback over email or. The very best is to actually sit down with someone using your app and like watching them using your app. For example, we like we are based in Vienna, and in Vienna there is the Museum of the Blind. So we actually went there and made an appointment um, with like one of the people there, and uh, let them use our app. And we sat together and took notes during the whole process and talked about the whole process. And that like helped us tremendously to get more information about what we are still doing wrong, what we could improve, what's already a nice way to do it. So that's definitely the best way. Try to find someone who is actually visually impaired or blind and uh, would like to use your app or try to use your app and then watch them and talk to them. And the second question is like how um, how to tell your your management that it's that it's needed? Well, that's tough. I don't know your management. Like um, for for us, it wasn't really a big question once we realized that there's value in it, because for us, it's like we really want to help people and want uh, as many people to be possible to use our app. If that's not the case for your app. You can maybe find arguments like you're increasing your user base because there, I think there are like 240 million uh, blind people according to the WHO or something like this worldwide. So that's quite a lot and there's actually many people and also like the chart I showed you earlier like with the situational and temporary disabilities where many, many people are affected by this, many more than we actually think they are. Okay, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Any more questions? Hi. I am Hi. over here. Yeah. Uh, great, great talk. Thank you. And uh, I have a question. Apple introduced in iOS 12 uh, Siri, sh Siri shortcuts. Uh -huh. uh, do you have plans to use it in your app? Because it's make, uh, it, it solves the same problem that uh, had your, um, I forget the name. Uh, Jessica? Yeah. 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 Um, I can't fully follow yet. H how does it solve the same problem? Because uh, uh, user can um, uh, can script the scenario of using your app, uh -huh. and uh, if she needed to uh, make some note quick in uh, your mind notes, uh, then she can ask Siri, and Siri will do it. Uh, 
if uh, without uh, using an, in an app. Uh, ah, okay, now, now I get it. Um, so the answer to your question, whether we are planning to support uh, Siri shortcuts, yes. Um, I actually never thought about the connection between Siri shortcuts and accessibility up to now, so thanks for that. Um, and that's actually a, a pretty good uh, case that you described, like having something like automation, having something like Siri shortcuts, uh, makes those devices even more powerful for people with disabilities because then they have another way and just asking Siri to do certain tasks in your app and don't even need to go through uh, certain elements. So, yeah, it's definitely a good way to do it. But it shouldn't be like the only way. Like, I wouldn't rely on uh, Siri shortcuts as the only possible way to use my app with voiceover. So, it should be an additional step. Thank you. Any uh, more questions? If that's it, let, let's thank Matthias. Okay. Give ah, him you. this like diploma.